on data and, and how these things work, right? So, um, so let's just get let's get into this here. So, um, let me my screen. There we go. Okay, so you know we we often start with every session just by you know giving a, a you know an outline of where it is. I would say it's more beginner to intermediate in this session. Um, and you know we're gonna we're gonna talk about some kind of higher level concepts. You know a little bit about the past and a little bit about the future. Um, we have a few topics we're going to cover, but we would love questions and comments from you. Um, uh, my, my counterpart uh, on this presentation today and I, and I love taking questions from the crowd and, and, and would love engagement. Um, you know, I also wanted to thank, you know, the first 20 or so people that joined this webinar because we're going to send you a, a version of this Cockroach TV definitive guide, um, which we recently published. And oh boy, thank, thank God we got a, a cockroach on the cover of our book because it would have been weird if it was another animal. Uh, but we're also going to give away, you know, a, a copy of the book for anybody who asks uh, great questions during the session as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the top five or something, I think, is what the, the team had said. So, you know, the top questions will definitely get a, a copy of the book as well. So, uh, so you get to add that to your library. All right. Um, so with that, I am going to actually, I'm going to come off of, uh, oops, sorry about that, everybody. I'm going to come off of mute or I'm going to go on video. Um, Tim, are you out there, buddy? Jim, I'm out here. How you doing? All right. I'm doing very well. Um, I don't know. What do you call this? A cheese and pickle show, or what were you calling it? Ham and jam? I don't know how. What were you calling these sort of things? Ham and eggs. I don't know. Cheese ham and, and eggs. Pickles. That was it. So I don't know, buddy. So uh, well, everybody, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is my friend Tim Vale. Uh, Tim Vale leads uh, our sales engineering efforts here at Cockroach Labs, and uh, somebody I've known for really about a dozen or so years. Um, really, really a, a deep experience in kind of the reality of using these kind of technologies uh, within organizations. Um, Tim, is there? Do you want to introduce me? That, that might be fair. I introduced you. So Holy, we do this that's back interesting. and forth. Put you that's a wrinkle. Uh, <laughs> look, Jim is our chief, or what is it, principal product evangelist, but someone who absolutely enjoys and maybe does it better than anyone in the business out talking about uh, the products that he represents. And in this case, we're very fortunate to have him talking about Cockroach uh, DB and Cockroach Labs. So excited to have known Jim and worked with Jim for a while. Yeah, well, thanks. That was really nice, Tim. I'm going to ask you to do that more publicly <laughs> I don't, yeah, in the I don't future. Know that I it was the nicest again. thing you've ever said to me. Yeah, I know. No, I know. Now I re instantly regret it. <laughs> So y'all, we're gonna talk um, about resilience and resilience around data mostly. Um, you know, this is a database that, that we work with here. Um, I have a bit of a presentation here. Presentation probably is about 30 minutes um, and then Tim and I will kind of engage along the way. Um, I'll, I'll lob some questions into Tim along the way. He, like I said, um, the, the real world experience and kind of how these things actually work, uh, Tim is a, is a great representative of that. So um, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump into it. So everything fails. Um, and I, I like to talk about this all the time. You know, the actually the nature of uh, Cockroach Database and the name Cockroach Database really comes from the from the resilient nature of what we do here at, at this company, um, and 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 the way that we think about the database. But I think you know the the way that systems have been designed over the past couple of years is is to limit the amount of of impact of failure. And I think with the with the advent of distributed systems and really kind of a shift in the way we think about infrastructure over the past five years maybe 10, um, you know, we're starting to combat this in, in as many ways as we can. You know, we once thought of things as kind of like active passive, how do we be more active active? And, and I think there's just some core concepts in, in this world of distributed systems, but it doesn't matter. In the end, everything is still gonna fail. Hardware is hardware, um, you know, humans are humans. Um, you know, all of our systems have some sort of, you know, fault tolerance and, and, and failure built into them. And so really, I think, you know, we think about this concept of RPO, RTO, it's really about measuring, um, you know, the impact of a failure. Um, it's not preventing because anybody who says they're going to 100% prevent any failure, it's just not. It's just not a true. Can we get? I love the the title of this presentation because how do you get to near zero, RPO RTO? And I think that's the key concept here. And and I think if we if we think about all of our systems in this way, you know, we're we're actually going to be okay because if you if you if, you know, there's whole websites you know like that are dedicated to understanding when things go down. Um, you know, cloud providers fail, you guys, and regions and cloud providers fail. It happens all the time. And we, we see it all the time. Okay, so if we know we have redundant regions and these sort of things, what can we do to architect this resilience into the system? Because 
these websites, you know, this is just a simple kind of screenshot of down detector from, I guess, like almost two years ago, I did this. Um, but this happens all the time, y'all. And, and I think, you know, I think that the more that we can actually approach our systems and the way we think about things um, with, with resilience in mind and, 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 and an understanding and acceptance that there is going to be failure, um, the better off we're going to be. Um, I mean, there's there's entire companies built into this. I, you know, my friend Colton Andrews has a company called Gremlin. It's called it's like disaster testing, you know, and it's you know chaos testing. I think it's called right. And so, you know, th these things happen, and I think that's it's a critical kind of thing. So, you know, when I start to think about you know these these things, right? Systems fail, right? Over time, everything's going to fail. Um, and and we've come up with these concepts over the past couple of years around RTO and RPO. And RTO and RPO really are, are kind of concepts that, uh, you know, the, the team at Google really first originated, you know, as they shifted from kind of DevOps and admins into this kind of concept of the system reliable engineer. You know, they, they really started to think like, well, what does uptime mean, right? And, and what, is the, what, is, what, is, what are the things that we actually want to measure when it comes to uptime? And, and what's the impact of, of these downtimes, right? And so like, how do you take an impact and measure that as an objective, I think is where these things come from. Um, and, it, and it was really a different way of looking at, you know, a, a, a task or a group of people that were just there basically kind of keep lights on to actually give them objectives. How, how well am I keeping the lights on? I think is one of those questions. So I don't know, Tim, you talk about RTO and RPO to people a fair amount, right? How do you, do you, do you get into this conversation, like where it came from and how it kind of shifts the, the conversation much? Yeah, we, we do occasionally. I mean, I think what's what's interesting about these concepts is that most people that we talk to out in the field, you know, even if they don't understand the history of the terms or really even understand a great detail, the definitions, they recognize that this is something that they need to be focused on. And, you know, mm -hmm. you know, depending upon who we're talking to and what their role is, this is either something they're actively managing or this is something they know is important to the company that they work for. Uh, but, you know, particularly people who are, you know, working with databases and initial critical databases, which is, you know, the space that I think we play in, you know, again, whether or not they're directly responsible is a different story, but folks understand, I think, intuitively uh, and very clearly that downtime hurts and anything they can do to kind of manage that is, is, is a good thing. So we do. I mean, it, it, these yeah. are these are important concepts out in the world today, for sure, especially databases, yeah. especially with with where the world is headed. Well, downtime hurts too, Tim. And it's it's not just like I have unplanned downtime here, but it's it's the planned downtime too, right? Like yeah, it's you know it's you funny. Have to do. Yeah, I mean, reading the slide, it's like, yeah, all of that stuff is true when it's unplanned. But guess what? It's also true when it's planned. I mean, yeah, you know, I think that's it's one of the things that we um, I mean, and, and I know I know RTO maybe more on the unplanned side, but regardless, right? I mean. If if your systems become unavailable for some period of time, that is there's going to be a cost. It doesn't matter whether you you knew that it was going to happen or not. I mean, there's still there's still pain inflicted there. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that that, that we pay yeah. really, really close attention to. Yeah. And when I, you know, it's funny, Tim, you talk about RTO and and this concept and the concept of unplanned downtime. Actually, RTO is something that I've thought about for a long time. I just never had a term for it because you know, I have I used to have to do migrations in the middle of the night. And we had a window of one hour. What was that? Mm -hmm. That was basically our recovery time objective. That that was really an RTO. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, if you, if you want to kind of reach back in time and make it very real for for the way that these things work, or even today, right? I think people do that, right? When they set up a migration or they, you know, they have some sort of like system outage, like, and it's, sometimes it's planned, and we can be out for five minutes, and that's it. That's your window. It's, systems are going to come back on, or ten, or whatever this. That is a recovery time objective. So RTO is the first concept. And that is basically the, the amount of time that the system can be offline, right? How long does it take for me to recover? And, you know, are you within that window or what percentage within that window typically people are measuring? And I think, you know, as an objective for a team, it's like, well, are we, are we within, you know, 5% or a sigma, whatever that is, around our RTO objective time frame of what that is. And I think that's, that's especially the, the first the first concept, right? And then the second concept is is RPO. And RPO is a little bit different to understand. Um, and that's kind of, you know, like, look at there's the, the time I was out, but then there's like, how do I remediate the event in itself? So Tim, how do you explain RPO to people? So, um, you know, the way I think about it, just to take, take a step back and just, you know, RTO is, you know, the time it takes to restore, you know, 
normal business operations for right. lack of a better term, right? So it's it's kind of the time where uh, where things are kind of in a, in a funky state. You know, RPO, and, and again, there's so many different definitions of this, but one of the ways that we talk about it in the field is you know, um, in some ways, you know, how much can you afford to lose, you know, in terms of data during this time? So, you know, mm-hmm. assuming or traditional systems assume that if an event has occurred, there's going to be some time where the database is offline, you know, how much data potentially do you lose uh, when trying to or attempting to recover from that? So that's that's how we talk about it. Again, everybody comes to the, the conversations that we have with slightly different interpretations, understandings, um, expectations. So, you know, one of the things we try to do is, okay, well, what, you know, what do these terms mean to you? And then, and then begin to have a conversation from there. But I I think it's, you know, it's first, it's um, how long is it going to take me to get back to normal? And then what have I lost when I do? Right. Right. And RTO is, RTO is at normalcy and RTO is basically, okay, great. Now I'm back to steady state kind of thing, right? <laughs> exactly. Now what? And, and it's funny that the, you know, this, this timeline here, uh, it could be really any amount of time, but, you know, often, you know, what we see with companies is like, okay, great. I had a, you know, an active passive system where the primary database went down the secondary comes back on and it services things. Okay. From an RTO point of view, the database is on, I can now service customers again. If you think about what does it take to then remediate the changes between the secondary database and the primary database, and how long does it take for you to basically make, you know, to, 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 to mitigate the changes and make sure you have the right data between the two of them? I think, yeah, right, exactly. That's that's mitigating changes, Tim. Um, how do you, how you know, inter- international well, sign for that, I believe, correct? It is, it is, man. You got it. I think people get it. And, and it's, but it's, but it's that's the kind of thing. Like, um, you know, I know GitHub had an outage a couple of years ago and they were out for about eight hours or something. And, um, you know, they came back online and it took a while for the secondary, you know, database to get remediated with the primary. And so you had code repositories that were kind of janky and it, it took mm. days, I think, for that to, to get resolved because, you know, the amount of commits that were going, you know, to make it very real for this audience, you know, is pretty, pretty extensive. Um, and that's, that's costly. Um, that, that is, that is a costly process for organizations. So, I think of RPO as like, when am I back to the point where, okay, we're going to move on from this kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like, that's it. We're, we're done. It's in our past. It's, you know, at RPO at that moment in time is when you're doing the postmortem, um, you know, because the things have been kind of resolved at that point. And so, but I think, you know, with, and like you said, Tim, everybody comes at it with a little slightly different, like conversation or definition of what that is. And I think it's because every organization is different um, and what they do is different and the data is different, right? So. Yeah, they absolutely, they bring, they, they have their own expectations of what this means. And, and oftentimes new, no two places are alike. Yeah. So it's an interesting, you know, like the, these two terms, first of all, I think are extremely important. I do love that we actually have terms and like we can set objective around these things. Like I think of all the things that have come out over the past couple of years in terms of the shift to like this SRE thing and kind of automation of things, I like these are two concepts that I think are great because we just never defined them before. I think we thought about these things, but there was never like this kind of like industry term to say, hey, this is what this thing is. And, you know, to me, it's kind of a, you know, somebody who's just been in this business for a while. I'm just, I'm happy that we actually do these sort of things. So, so what does this mean for the, for the database, right? Uh, but, oh, that's how I was going to talk about plan downtime here. So, so what do we do with databases today? You know, typically, you know, we have an application, you know, we're hitting a load balancer or a proxy, whatever that is. And, you know, we sit here and we hit against a, you know, single instance primary database. We synchronize that primary database with a secondary. Uh, maybe there's some shared storage underneath. Who knows? Who, who knows exactly what that is? But this is typically state of the art for the last, what, 30 years, 40 years. I mean, I think this is what we've done, right? This is just, this is just an active passive database where you have a primary and you have a secondary. You're writing to one, you're synchronizing. Okay, lots of things can go wrong here, right? What happens, right? Um, well, first of all, like active passive is pretty expensive. Um, you have these two massive, huge machines on two massive, huge servers as backup. Um, you're you're basically wasting compute cycles on one of them. They're not being engaged. They're not being used. Oh, and also, I mean, typically it's not just this this cylinder, right? It's not just the database itself. There's backup systems. There's the team it takes to actually manage these things. Um, you know, the the complications of just testing this environment and doing these sort of things. So I think you know that the cost alone is pretty hefty when you're doing kind of active passive. How do we do this in a better way? 
I think the best, the second one is this, this synchronization thing. And so what happens when there's, you know, a break in the line and synchronization? Uh, you know, I, I know there's ways to mitigate this. You can buffer things, there's pooling, there's lots of different ways you actually get pretty tricky around synchronization, but there's lots of things that go around when, go awry when we're synchronizing between two systems. Um, it's funny, I, I don't know about you, Tim, but I, it's fun, when I talk about active active systems, I try to erase the word synchronization out of my vocabulary in the, in the modern world. I don't know. Um, do you, do you run into these sort of things too in customers with uh, synchronization issues? I, well, we do obviously, but I think just commenting kind of on the active passive setup and I, I know we'll probably touch on this a little bit later, but you know, it's amazing to me the extent to which this, these concepts, this design pattern, you know, or whatever you want to call it is really ingrained and embedded in, yeah. in kind of the, the, the database architecture and philosophy. I mean, so many of our customers just, you know, come to, come to these conversations with the expectations. This is how it has to be, because this is how it's always been. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it, it is, we're going to go on to explore and you've already mentioned it's on the slides right now. I mean, you know, th there's a cost associated with this, but I think one of the, you know, the interesting things about having, we're starting to have this kind of conversation about a new way of thinking is, is boy, the extent to which there's like this kind of deep, almost emotional attachment uh, to, hey, what do you mean? I don't have to have a secondary database. Yeah. What, what, what do you mean? There's not synchronization, you know? And so, uh, you know, as we get into it, we touch more on that, but I think what's just fascinating to me is just how, how deeply rooted and, and, and tightly held these beliefs are. Well, yeah, Tim, and I think these, you know, certain people have this attachment to it. And it's like, okay, so if I'm not managing these two systems and making sure synchronization works, that was my job. What am I doing? Right. And I think it's like, yeah. what do you want to focus yeah. on? You know, right. And like, and I, it's a very real concern. I totally understand yeah. it. And, and there's lots of things going on there, but there's got to be a better, there is a better way. And so, right. So this, with these sort of things too, we talked about, you know, recovery time objective, right? So when one goes down, how long does it take for the secondary to get there? Um, you know, the proxy has to do this failover. Is it 10 seconds? Is it 30? Is it three minutes? Um, it's all kind of a, a moment in time where you're, you're either losing contact or depending on your business and what you're trying to do with that application, it can be, can affect. And then remediation again, you know, how do we get to steady state so that the two systems are exactly the same again? So the primary database and the secondary, the active and the passive, whatever you want to call it, how do we, what is that moment in time where they are exactly the same again? Uh, and, and all the costs it takes to actually remediate these sort of things. So when I think about, you know, active passive and this sort of thing, you know, these are all really kind of issues and, and costs associated with this sort of thing. Oh, and by the way, uh, we also uh, need to fail over regions because, well, you know, cloud deployments in regions fail. And so typically what we'll see is, you know, hey, somebody's deployed, say, on US East and they're doing a synchronization to, to Central, um, because they need to be able to survive the failure. And so this failover time gets extended. Um, the egress cost of actually synchronizing yep. data from one place to the next is, 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 is intense. Uh, and, and there's just lots of complications here. Um, and it's just something I think is pretty difficult for people. Um, so there has to be a better way, um, obviously. Uh, and, and that's, I think, you know, for, I, I love this video, by the way. Um, and so, uh, and, and for us here at Cockroach Labs, it's absolutely like, and I think there's lots of systems that are out there that are actually taking things in a different way. And I think about, you know, I think about like Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes is one of these systems too that, that is active active, you know, it, it, it can actually, you know, spin up and spin down and make sure things are just on, right? I, I always think of Kubernetes as like whack-a-mole. If something dies, it comes back all the time, right? Like that's exactly what it does. You know, for us, this is like an active, you know, this is an active active relational database, right? So. You know, we took the core principles of distributed systems and applied them to a database. I always like to think about, you know, the primitives. What are those principles that we're trying to actually apply to make things work, right? So, you know, in an active active system, well, there, there's physical nodes that kind of work like a single system. You know, in, in an active active system, well, every node can accept reads and writes for the database and, and being massively multi-master, which is not a simple thing to do because if we're gonna actually put data into a clustered system, um, and I have, you know, three nodes or 10 nodes or 15 or whatever that is, and they're all expecting reads and writes. What happens when there's conflicts? That sort of thing, right? And, and, and if you're going to do this, you know, does the, the data live in every node or is the data distributed? And how do you find that node the data within these systems, right? Um, how do we kind of get rid of the concept, like I said before, how do we just eliminate the word synchronization from what we do? 
uh, and replace that with you know what we call you know replication. Can we span data centers? Um, and, and if we're going to span data centers and we're going to actually go across the whole region, well, can we actually you know fight the speed of light? Because it takes time to go from New York to Sydney as as an electron through a wire that has to go across the United States and through a couple different repeaters and then underneath the ocean uh, on, a, on, a, you know, on a journey all the way over to you know, Australia. Did you just right? say so as a, an electron? Well, is that yeah. what you said? As yeah. an electron? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I like ultimately it's what it is, right? Like it's a one or a zero and that thing's floating through a wire somewhere, right? I just, I, you know, since, uh, since high school, I hadn't heard of uh, you know, electrons and protons and neutrons and all the, you went very scientific on me, it just, so it threw me for started, a loop, but I like started it. started really nice to me today, Tim. I don't know. I know. I, I need to make up for it now by turning me. Yeah, but it's true. And I, you know, I think, you know, Tim, you've seen some like deeper, larger, broader geography kind of issues, yeah. right? And are, are people thinking about, you know, the, this, uh, this latency? Absolutely. I, you know, I think, I think what folks are, are catching on to, I think pretty quickly is, is, you know, my, my disaster recovery strategy, my, my strategy to minimize, you know, RTO and RPO can't just be about, you know, putting a mirror of my, my primary infrastructure right next door, you know, in, in the rack next to me, you know, the, the, there needs to be space and distance, you know, between, between different <laughs> things. You know, we call them a cockroach failure domains, right? Things that are kind of designed or guaranteed to fail independently. There shouldn't be you know, cascading failures. If I, if my data center catches fire and, and both my active and passive are sitting right next to each other, you know, right. that, that's not, uh, that's not a really good scenario. So, yeah. you know, the farther things apart are, um, the more likely they are to, um, to not be affected by some, you know, similar catastrophe or cause. Yeah. And so, yes, the distance between these things becomes very important, but that is precisely what people are looking for. I have to, build real strong resilience into my architecture. I need to be able to suffer the loss of a data center or multiple data centers, a region in cloud parlance, you know, maybe yeah. even the loss of a cloud provider in its entirety, you know, not necessarily because all their data centers have gone down, but because they have a networking hiccup, a DNS routing issue, some other thing that makes, you know, takes Amazon or Google or Microsoft or whomever offline temporarily. So having kind of options you know, about where these different pieces live and, and allowing them to um, uh, interact independently becomes really, really important. Yeah. Or the, like the unfortunate circumstance of like, you know, what happened here in the States, what was it last year, Tim, where the tornadoes were hitting Kentucky? Um, mm -hmm. And I know I, we had a customer who had, you know, resilient baked into, you know, two different data centers that were in that region. And, you know, one data center yeah. got hit and the other one got like yeah. narrowly missed by like what, like, yeah. like a mile or something, right? And so like, yeah. These things happen. And so thinking about the distance, thinking about the things that can go wrong, I think is actually a pretty important thing. But when you start to do that, there's actually a lag because uh, the speed of light, right? And yep. it's kind of one of those key things. So the electrons, um, Jim. Yes, ex and the electrons. That's right. So uh, we're getting some good questions come in. Um, I'm going to oh, actually right. answer both of those uh, that, that came through. So, Tim, you've got to be on the QA, buddy. Like you're, you're there. You're, 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 you're okay. the color man here. So, okay. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that. that. And, and we're going to get to these in actually the, the next couple of slides. Oh, yeah, yeah. About if we're going to eliminate synchronization, how do we distribute data? This um, gentleman exactly wants a book. Uh, or th this, this participant wants a book. That's um, right. The, two questions. I like it. Participant. Yeah. So CockroachDB, first of all, is just it literally. So let me just get into exactly. The, there was a question about how do we eliminate synchronization between nodes? Um, and what are the strategies for distributing data? You know, is it at the file system level? Well, it's not really at the file system level. It's it's actually within the, the software, the database itself. You know, the way we replicate data across a, a cluster. We use something called Raft and distributed consensus. We'll touch on a little bit of that. Um, but just before we get into that, you know, Cockroach actually appears as Postgres. Uh, you know, I mean, it's wire compatible with Postgres. So the tools that work with you know Postgres will work with Cockroach. But it's a relational database. Um, you know, you, you want referential integrity, you want aggregations and views and uh, inner joins and outer joins and all the beautiful joins you want, you know, I mean, the power of the database is there. Um, and I think that's what's interesting, um, the way that it exposes itself to the application. Underneath that, the architecture is very different. And I think that's where the, the magic of kind of how these things work in terms of you know, how do we how do we deal with distributing versus actually uh, synchronization of data? And that, that is really, um, when we write data in Cockroach, uh, we're actually writing data in triplicate 
or more, um, you actually decide there's a replication factor in the database itself. So every write is actually written to three different physical instances or five or seven or nine, some odd number, because what we do is we get a quorum write. So in this case, I'm going to write the Mueller record, say, to three different you know, instances of the database um, all at once. And as long as two of three of those and I get a quorum, um, I can actually commit that record. So we aren't writing to one of the nodes and then it's talking to the others and writing that data. No, 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 we're actually writing three times to these, these three different nodes and we're gonna write in triplicate. Um, and this is really gonna allow us to actually do that survival, right? Like, so if one of these nodes goes away, I still have two of three of the copies. If the node goes away for a long time, well, it's smart enough to actually create a third copy somewhere within the system itself too. All right, so Cockroach is pretty intelligent underneath the covers in, in how we actually do that. And so that's kind of how we get away with this. We don't synchronize we're actually doing this replication. Um, and there's this, this thing called Raft. Raft is a distributed consensus algorithm. Um, if anybody wants to actually check that out, um, there's a great website. I don't know how many people I have sent to this website, Tim, but um, the Secret Lives of Data um, is, I don't know, Tim, can you type, just type that? I know you know that site. You, if, would you mind typing that in the chat? Um, I will definitely post it in the chat. I'm, I'm yeah. furiously typing answers to these other questions. Awesome, awesome. Um, and so, yeah, so the secret lies of data gives you a really good explanation of how Raft works. It's actually pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. So, um, but, but the other thing is here with Cockroach is actually pretty interesting is every node is a gateway to the entirety of the database, which basically means I don't need like a write node to handle writes. I mean, we're doing basically truly kind of, you know, multi-master across, you know, uh, partitions of data that are living across this entire backend distributed system. And any user can access data. You know, so for in this case, let's just say, you know, I have user one here on the left hand side, you know, I want to select Mueller from the people uh, table. Well, I can ask any node and I'm asking a node here and this node only has records for Schmidt and Schneider on it. And it knows within the context of the whole database where to find that data. So it's going to go ask that other node and then return that answer to user one. Meanwhile, if user two is accessing the data and it accesses a node that has that record. Maybe I could do something where I'm just accessing that data right away and it's right in front of me. I don't have to do this hop and this back and forth between those various different nodes. In this case, we're doing something called follower reads, which is a, which is a, a bit more of a complex concept. Um, you know, in Raft, if you do get to learn this, there's this concept of a, a, a Raft leader, which is kind of the definitive source of understanding across, you know, a replica set of, of three copies. Sometimes you just want to read from a, from a follower. And, and so that's, that's what we're doing here. But we can have this very, very fast access to that data um, if somebody accesses that. Now, we do something where we do something called geo partitioning, where we can actually store data on nodes that are close to users in these broadly geographic kind of situations. Um, and, and we get into a lot. We've had lots of webinars and that sort of stuff as well. So, um, so we, we also need to kind of survive these, these regional failures, right? Um, and, and by the way, allow for low latency access to data uh, within and across regions, kind of what I was just referring to. You know, so here's a kind of a, a simple kind of, you know, outline of, of the way that we see kind of cockroach database used today. Um, and, you know, typically we'll see people use like three nodes and three regions. Uh, and, and we do this because of this, this replication factor I was talking about, where we're writing things three times. Well, what if I write, you know, one copy of the data in three different regions? Well, if I, sur if I lose an entire region, right, um, I still can get the data. I still have two, three of the copies. I still have consensus. I have quorum right on those copies. And so we're able to do this. And actually we do this at the table level. So uh, for each table, you're actually defining this. Sometimes you just want all three copies in one region. Like I want, you know, all the copies of customer data that is, you know, for people on the East Coast to live. I want all three copies in region one. So Tim has very fast access to it. He's in, he's in Atlanta, you know, but I'm, I'm actually in Mexico. So maybe my copies, you know, all live in region three. So I have very fast copies of that, right? And so but particularly, we see people set this up by, you know, thinking through the, 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 the concept of what they want to survive, what that failure domain that Tim was talking about for each particular table. And so I can have, you know, one copy in each region. And upon this situation where the failure happens, I still have access to that data, which is fantastic. So each piece of data in each table has different goals uh, when you're using something like this. And I think that's one of those key concepts where you have to start thinking about, you know, the physical nature of your data. I think a lot of people, when you when you design a database, you know, we think of a logical model, right? We think of you know normalization and 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 referential integrity and cardinality of queries and all these things. So that's all really important still. But I think when you start thinking distributed, 
for me, what, what really kind of started to, to help me understand distributed systems is you have to start thinking about the physical nature of data and the physical nature of compute and whatever that is. And I think that was the trick and the, and the paradigm shift for me to kind of really move, move into the kind of the next, the next world in, in these distributed systems, because you know what, things come back online and I simply redistributed the data nothing was lost. And here we are back solid state. So I don't know, Tim, what was RTO, RPO in this situation where I had kind of boom, 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 right? Like where I had this kind of three things. I mean, we do this all the time, right? RTO was what? Zero. Because we just we just switched load balancers and we, we didn't lose anything. Um, and then RPO, well, we didn't actually, we were never out of steady state, right? And so I think that's kind of one of those things, things about um, the, the way these things work. So um, let's see here. So, so. Uh, you know, there's another concept of high availability. So Tim, how we get into these conversations all the time, right? Like, so what's the difference between RPO, RTO and high availability? Are you still typing over there? I, I was still, I was, I was fiercely typing and then, so what are the, what are the differences between yeah, high what's availability? The difference between RPO, what, no, what's the difference between RPO, RTO and high availability? Well, so I think high availability, and maybe there's an answer here. So I'm, I'm just, I haven't read this slide to know what, whether I'm going to tell you something wrong that you didn't want or something good. But the way I think about it is, and I think the way we describe it in the field is, is high availability is, is the thing that you are working toward, right? You know, providing a system that is highly available, right? That can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. A way you measure the extent to which you are highly available is, is, are those objectives that we've been talking about? What is my RTO? What is my RPO? Um, you know, those, so they're not necessarily the same thing, although they're, they're very much related. And, 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 you know, in some ways, one measures the other. Is how I would think about it. I don't know, Jim. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever asked me that question. So did I give an answer that, that you like? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a wrong answer, honestly, Tim. I think, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, I think that's right. And it's, a, you know, often we'll hear about, you know, five nines availability. Yeah. Right. right. And, and that sort mm -hmm. of thing, right. And I think people think that, like, that's the measure. And, you know, especially with, with cloud services, you know, with, with Cockroach TV and, and, you know, we're a managed service, right. So you could just go spin it up and use it. I think people, you know, think about, you know, what's your, what's your nines, right? And I think that's yeah, such a key concept. So you're right. I mean, there is that, that, but also, you know, again, I, going back to, and we used to talk about this all the time. And again, this is the variability with different customers, right? You know, what defines, how do you define how highly available your system is? If it's, you know, if you can tolerate going offline for an hour, two hours, three hours, you still consider yourself highly available. What if your, you know, what if your tolerance is only five minutes? And again, so it's kind of what your thresholds are, what your That's tolerances right. are, really what helps you define or, or, you know, communicate the extent to which you are highly available. And I think, you know, RTO and RPO are, are you know, it says when things go wrong, you know, this is what I need to happen or this is mm -hmm. what I expect to happen. You know, and, right. and, and again, I, you know, maybe another way to think of it is RTO and RPO help describe you know, kind of a measurement for what's happened when things fail, you know, almost like That's kind right. of taking the negative high availability is the positive, right? I mean, this is how often I'm going to be up, but when things go down, this is what, you know, this is I'm going to measure. So, yeah, because you're right. I mean, five nines, that's a, that's something we, we hear a lot, particularly when we talk about the cloud, right? In our cloud offering, how many nines do you have? Well, how many nines do you want? How many nines do you need? I got some nines. How many nines do you need? Exactly. Yeah. And I, but it's, but it's actually, a, it's a critical concept. And I think, you know, people need to be understanding of, you know, what is the SLA? What is that? What's that? What is the service actually providing you in terms of like, what are they promising um, from what that is? And I think that's kind of one of those, those key things. And I think high availability is one of these things. So I don't know, Tim, do you want to take a couple of these questions live? Um, yeah, I think let's, in particular, let's, there's let's... this one of talking about, you know, is Cockroach good for OLAP or OLTP? Um, you know, I, I, you know, how do you, how do you talk about that with customers, right? Like I guess there's things that we can do on both sides, but how are we good for both OLTP and, and OLAP? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question and, and something we, we do get asked oh. a lot. And so let me, let me give you kind of maybe a little bit of a longer answer to attempt to do it justice, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to be somewhat quick here. So, you know, certainly our original 
intention, design, kind of our, our mission statement, uh, for lack of a better term, was very much focused on, you know, being the best possible OLTP engine on the planet. Um, that is something that, that we have worked very, very hard to do over the years and feel like we've done a wonderful job, um, you know, achieving. One of the ways we measure how well we do on traditional OLTP type workloads is, is using some kind of well-known, um, you know, industry standard benchmarks like TPCC, which is, again, this kind of a very well-known OLTP type workload. And we test that nightly and we've written kind of at length about comparisons to other products, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of really good information out there. But what's changed, I think, over the last maybe couple of years in varying degrees is that we have begun to expand beyond purely focused, focusing on OLTP workloads. And, and, and what that means in practice is not simply just testing our performance on things like OLTP or TPCC, but extending that to kind of more well-known or OLAP-like workloads, TPCH, TPCE, and others. And we've introduced a number of features to help us be more competitive with those workloads. So vectorized query engine, um, a number of different things to kind of make us better suited for handling OLAP type workloads. So if you had asked this question two years ago, I think it would have been without a doubt, absolutely OLTP, forget OLAP, yeah. you know, it's a whole other thing. And I think I think our, our, our stance is changing a little bit. We're definitely a great OLTP engine, no question about it. But there are many kind of OLAP type workloads that might work really, really well now on Cockroach. And yeah. so I, I think that's, I know that was a, a bit of a, a longer answer, but I, I would say that it's, um, you know, we're somewhere in the middle now. Are we out there yeah. waving the like HTAP banner? No, not yet. Uh, but we're getting a lot better at those type workloads. Absolutely. Well, and that's right, Tim. And it, it is deserving of a longer answer because it's actually a critical decision for anybody who's, you know, thinking through the kind of larger data architecture and, you know, where does this fit? Where does that fit? You know, I, I'm not a believer in convergence of databases. I think, you know, OLAP workloads are very different than OLTP workloads in the end. I think the way you execute those type of queries, do you want to do them in a distributed environment? Do you want to pay for like using, you know, compute across multiple different regions? What you do? There's lots of reasons, but, but it really comes down to kind of what are the analytics, right? And, and like you said, yeah, like, can we do lightweight, you know, transactional, you know, operational analytics? Hell, you bet, you bet, yeah, we can, you know what I mean? And, you know, Tim mentioned like this vectorized query engine. Basically, it's like, how do I do a columnar query? You know, can I do an end of a totals on how many widgets I sold in Austin? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. And so, you know, we're not doing like some weird like cubes and recursive queries and that sort of thing. But could you do that on Cockroach? Well, possibly, you know, I think, you know, one of the guys on your team, Tim, set up, you know, Trino Presto on top of Cockroach. And so it's his Postgres. So, you know, if it's going to work on one of these engines, great. And I think the other kind of thing here, it's just actually really important to think about. We start to think about OLTP and OLAP in, 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 the or, in, in any organization. What's the common language between the two? It's SQL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep, it sure is. And, and, and that is the piece that it I think sure you know, is. it sure is, right? And like, what is the language of analytics? And it's SQL, like it or not, y'all, I think our grandkids are going to be using SQL. Um, yeah. and, and it's not going anywhere. And, and I think especially with the advent and the importance of analytics in, in organizations today. So I think, you know, it, it just works in the, it, to me, I think about, you know, where does OLTP and OLAP fit? I think if we just think about it in terms of this all comes together into one kind of one data architecture for what you need to accomplish in your organization, you know, can you do some crossover things and the two different types of systems? Yeah. Are some things good enough for a certain? Yeah, you bet. Um, are you going to do more complex analytics on Cockroach? Probably not. And that's okay too, because we've yeah. optimized for, you know, consistent low latency transactions, which, which leads to the next question, Tim. Hmm. Um, and I think, you know, I think this is probably the last one we'll take here. I, you know, this, well, this, I, if there's more, please, y'all, gosh, by any means, you know, type in there. Um, you know, people talk to us about the CAP theorem yep. often. Uh, this is kind yes. of one of those distributed things, systems things, Tim. So, yep. you know, there's kind of two different types of databases, a CP and an AP. So yep. how, how do you talk about, you know, us in the context of the CAP theorem? Yeah, this is another one that... Uh... That comes up a ton, and, and you know we've done we've done dedicated webinars on, on this. Uh, Cap theorem is is again an important kind of anchor concept that uh, that most people have a, a vague notion of or understand. And so, you know, helping helping folks 
figure out kind of where we fall on that spectrum is, is usually an important concept. But the reason it takes a little longer is I think sometimes we spend a lot of time talking about as we have today, RTO and RPO and high availability. And so, you know, right. just for those of you who may not know, you know, CAP theorem is, you know, consistency available and availability essentially in the presence of a network partition, you know, so, you know, the P is always going to be there, which are you going to choose? Are you going to choose consistency or availability? And, um, and, and because we spent all day really and, and talk a lot about availability, people might assume that, oh, you must be an AP system because that's all you talk about is availability, but it's actually different. Um, what, what we believe very strongly is that you need to be, you need to build architectures as Jim described through, you know, raft consensus and multiple replications, et cetera, et cetera, that are highly available, very resistant failure, but should failure occur, as an OLTP engine, as a system of record database, as something we want and people are building mission critical workloads on, if and when something goes haywire, right? There is a partition, that P comes into play in, in CAP. What we as a database, what we as Cockroach believe is we have to actually guarantee consistency of your That's data. Right over availability. So there will be times if we can't figure things out, if you've lost a majority of, of replicas, we, given that we are a CP system, not an AP system, a CP system, we will favor always providing consistent data as opposed to serving something and claiming availability, potentially incorrect data. So I know it kind of goes a little bit against, hey, haven't you been talking about availability? Aren't you an AP system? We are we are very hard to kill, meaning we're almost always going to be available. But should something happen, right, we will uh, we will require consistency, yeah, or we will guarantee consistency. And I think well, that's and important. I, yeah, and Tim, it's you know the, this cap theorem thing. We we do get in a lot of conversations about this, and I think it's a great. I, I actually, it's a, you know Eric Brewer who came up with this. Um, I think it's a really wonderful theorem actually because it makes you really think about things. The, the interesting things about the two types of database, CP, right? That's what we are versus AP, which is kind of more of like a document store or something. Is if you're a CP, it doesn't mean you're like, it's not binary. Like the availability goes to zero. And if you're available, it doesn't mean like consistency is going to go to zero. You're going to get some level. It's just that if you're one or the other, the, the level, like the five nines, that, that like five nines availability is what we got. I can't give you 1000% availability. Uh, in my system because I'm actually optimized for consistency, but I can get you close, right? And I think that's the, that's the key piece here. It's like, you know, what are the ranges, right? Yeah, and then I think, you know, so, so I kind of described what we were, but I think, you know, one another way to kind of understand better about what we are is to talk about what we're not. And so, you know, it, it's kind of, you were saying, if you think about other NoSQL or other earlier, you know, distributed data storage engines that, that were more AP-like, what it would mean is that if there was a network partition, you know, th they would be ready, willing, and able to serve data that could have been possibly incorrect, you know. And, and if I'm a banking application and I withdraw, you know, money from my bank and something happens, right? The bank can't afford to take a guess, and I don't want the bank to take a guess on my behalf. I want to know exactly what that data is. But in AP systems, right. if a partition or occur. I could be reading and writing, making decisions based on stale, inaccurate, old data. Um, and that's just something that, again, for the type of workloads that we want to, to we want to run, and often our customers do run, you know, that 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 risk that the data that is served to an application is incorrect or wrong is is just too much to bear. Yeah. It, it, uh, as we it, you know, these conversations comes back to the workload and what's the data. My question to everybody: What's the data? What are you trying to do? What 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 are you what are your goals? Right. So, so there you know there are two other questions, and I actually had to look this term up. I don't, Jim. I don't know if this is a term you have ever heard before. It I, was I not have, uh, one I had heard. Bipartite, uh, bipartite network. I thought, what on earth is that? So, it's a. Uh, I looked it up, and then I closed my window, so now I've kind of forgotten the definition. No, I hear it is consisting of two parts. So I think what 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 this question is ultimately getting to is. Um, or at least how I'm going to answer it um, is, you know, when we have a distributed system, uh, a distributed database, we've talked about kind of how we can build and indicated, or hinted at how we can build consistent or um, very available architectures. What you actually can do, right, is you can have nodes of cockroach 
existing across not only different regions, right, or different availability zones within a single cloud or provider, thus their single network, but actually you can deploy cockroach nodes across multiple cloud providers, again, multiple networks. So when we do talk about kind of large, highly distributed deployments of cockroach, you can envision and, and build and run instances of cockroach that span not just a single network provided by a single provider, but actually run a single logical database that spans multiple pieces or types of infrastructure across multiple networks. And thus, I think the definition of bipartite or um, you know, uh, more than one, essentially, right. um, a network. You can deploy cockroach and networks like that um, in, in environments like that. In fact, it's something we have some of our very largest customers doing today because, again, they don't want to be, they don't want to suffer the consequences of a system-wide network outage across multiple data centers. They want right. to have multiple networks, multiple providers in order to achieve that level of high availability. So yeah. great question. Awesome word. Uh, additional points uh, for this participant for adding a new word to, to at least my, it sounds like maybe your vocabulary. Me too. I had to actually type it to actually learn it. So I did. So. Bipartite. I don't, and I don't know if I have the, the uh, pronunciation right, but it sounds, sounds right. Yep. So I guess in summary, um, I think we're at the end. Of, we took all the questions. If there are any questions, please, gosh, by all means, you know, throw them into the chat if you want to hear Tim talk. I love hearing Tim talk, y'all. Um, you know, there is this old way. There was the, you know, the legacy concepts of resilience where it was these active passive systems. And, you know, I, I think when we, when we all design systems going forward into the future, and it's not just the database. I think the database is a key piece of that. And it's part of your stack, your application stack. Thinking through these concepts of how do I get things to be active, active, um, you know, in your own compute and what you're trying to do in your application, I think is a, is a key thing to really be thinking about. And, you know, for me, that's, you know, the, the big lesson I've learned over the past four years here at Cockroach is like, how do we actually integrate this into the system itself? How do I build for resilience? Um, you know, how do I build for scale, right? And these sort of things. And how do I build for ubiquity? I think those are the three things I always think about. And I think, you know, the database definitely has a role in this and can help. Um, but how do you actually, you know, move these things into, into your you, software? You said so, ubiquity? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do I guess stuff Another everywhere? Another great you know? word. This I is like, word, a, Tim, so. this is... I'm learning yeah. a lot today. Yep, Good words, on, big words. Good, come on now. Uh, so one more one more question did come in, Tim. Um, so, yep. uh, you know, have we done benchmarks around, you know, these broadly distributed clusters, right? And so, um, and, and what are the acceptable latencies uh, for, for these sort of things, you know? Should I, do we have time? Should I give this kind of a, a yeah. thorough answer? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, this is an interesting one. So I, I do a lot of work with benchmarking, uh, you know, kind of uh, personally, quite honestly, and uh, and professionally. So this is an area of, of, of great interest of mine. I, maybe I'll, I'll answer it like this. I mean, the short answer is yes, of course, we have, uh, we do and, and will continue to do. Uh, it's, you know, being able to, to create uh, geo-replicated clusters, geo-partition clusters and, and run significant workloads is obviously a, a core value proposition of Cockroach. So we test it very heavily and do, um, and do as much benchmarking as we can. I think oftentimes what's behind this question is, you know, um, I want to do it myself and, um, you know, can I run kind of well-known benchmarking tools in order to gain some sense of how cockroach performs. And that's where the answer gets a little murkier. Um, yeah. Our website does have lots of good information about how to benchmark and performance test cockroach. I would highly encourage you to look at that. Uh, but one thing I would just leave you with when thinking about benchmarking a database that is truly and fully distributed, and really the answer is, is quite uh, easily seen, I think, on the slide that Jim is showing. In traditional databases, there's essentially a single endpoint that's capable of reading and writing databases. Therefore, you're using traditional benchmarking frameworks like JMeter, HammerDB, um, oh, what's the other one? There's a whole bunch of them that come up time and time again. It's pretty easy to do, right? I just point this load generator at a single endpoint and, and all of my data lives there. And, and so I just kind of get what I get. But if you look to the right at a cockroach cluster where you have three separate regions all contributing to a logical database, all potentially capable or all very much capable of accepting reads and writes, it's not really sufficient to generate a, a load on just a single region of this database. The reality is 
uh, what you would want is to generate load on all regions simultaneously. That's how you really test a distributed database like Cockroach. Yep. That, as it turns out, is not easy to do. There are not good publicly available frameworks for that. HammerDB, um, the SysBench, and these things are, 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 are typically single endpoint type things. So it is something we're actively working on, how to kind of create and build truly distributed benchmarking against truly distributed databases. More details to come on that. Uh, but just so you know, in the time or, you know, it kind of as it stands today, we perform very, very well in um, in these types of workloads, uh, I would argue best in class. Yeah. And I think, Tim, it was a bit of a it was a bit of a softball for you because I know you spent a lot of time uh, both working yes. within Cockroach Labs and then in the open source community thinking about benchmarking. And I think you're you're involved in a project doing benchmarking as well. So. Y'all, benchmarking is one of these things. I think the more people get involved with it, the better off we all are. Um, because like Tim said, there's these certain challenges that have to get sorted. So um, there's one last question. I don't know, Tim, do you want to take this? I, I did not read it yet. I saw you kind of very clearly reading. Yeah, let me let me see if question. we can get this one. So bear with the awkward you wanna, silence yeah. here as I read this. In a multi-cloud deployment. So you're you know spanning two different cloud providers, which is Kind of a unique thing that we do here. Hmm. Do you want to paraphrase it as well, Tim? I'm going to copy it. Oh, geez. Um, yeah. In a multi-cloud deployment, what sensitivity is there to partitioning due to time drift co-coordination between cloud providers? So one thing to consider, and again, this is why, why Cockroach, I think, is so uniquely positioned to succeed in this environment. Um, at least the first part of this question, which is an excellent one, uh, really does talk about time drift, uh, clock synchronization, coordination. Those are very, very important things in distributed systems. Certainly very important things in systems that effectively need to be serializable, meaning time order is important. Right. Um, so so uh, this was you know, very early on some of the primitive concepts that we built into Cockroach, how to deal with with uh, Drift, other uh, other databases, namely uh, one that I'm thinking of created by a cloud provider uses atomic clocks to, to manage clock drift and, and, and keep tight synchronization across nodes. Obviously, if you're deploying in Docker containers outside of that environment, you don't have access to atomic clocks. So the, the, the one I'm trying to get to is fundamentally Cockroach is built to understand, manage, and operate in environments where cloud drift is a thing. And what we do is is we look for and manage the extent to which clocks begin to drift apart and should they a node drift too far apart from the rest of the cluster and in effect it'll be booted out um, and it will act as if um, you know it will behave as if that that cluster is now unavailable so we manage and deal with clock drift um, i think quite nicely um, there's some other things in here that are a little tougher to answer um, I think some of this I could point you to documentation. The other thing, and I, and I will make this offer to, to anyone on this call and have in the past and will continue to do going forward. You know, I'm available on LinkedIn. Um, my email address is, uh, uh, you know, is, is pretty easy to identify and find. It's tv at cockroachlabs.com. You know, if you ever get into a position where, or a question like this that you really, really are curious about, don't hesitate to look me up on LinkedIn. Don't hesitate to send me an email. I'll do my level best to, to respond. And if I can't respond, I'll find somebody who can. But there are lots of different ways to get in touch with us. And whether you know that's through forums or what have you, or even reaching out to me individually, I'm more than happy yeah. to tackle some of this. Because there's a lot of there are a lot of really good stuff in that question. But it with with the time we have and and at the risk of sounding half-baked in my response, why don't we um Somebody's asking, I'll tell you the name of this, this man. Yeah. This, this man Who is, is this? Uh, Who is this person? Is Tim Vale. The, it's the me. one and it's, only. It's Tim Vale. It's me. Can TV me at cockroachlabs.com. Yeah. Okay, good. Awesome. I my headphones went there. So just TV at Cockroach Labs. And by the way, y'all, if you and, and I will extend Tim's uh gracious kind of offer to to help support. Um, you know, I'm just Jim at Cockroach Labs. So we both and but but more importantly, we do have a public Slack channel. Mm -hmm. of which we have engineers who built this stuff in their answering things all the time, y'all. And, and I think we are definitely, you know, 
definitely advocates of community and, and helping people through these questions all the time. So, you know, our public Slack channel is a great place to go. Um, but just to kind of wrap this all up, if you wanted to actually try Cockroach Database today, um, y'all, like we do have a free version of this uh, as a managed service. It's a serverless, so it's all consumption based. You only know, pay for what you use. It's free up to five gigabytes of storage, you know, a, a fair amount of transactions a month, if you will. Uh, it's all on a monthly billing cycle and you can actually use it for completely free. Uh, and so uh, if you want to actually go out and try Cockroach Database, oh gosh, by all means, please do that. Um, it's, it's available to everybody. Um, and then, you know, it, it, and like I said, if you have further questions, you have anything follow up, blah, 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 whatever that is, um, by all means, we're, we're always available on our community Slack channel too. So um, with that, I don't know, Tim, thank you so much for doing this today. I miss doing this with you. It's been a while since we've actually done this. Um, it's thoroughly enjoyable um, every time I'm on this with you. So thank you very much for taking the time, buddy. Of course. And, and great questions from the folks online. Yeah. Really appreciate the engagement, really, really thoughtful questions. And hopefully, Hopefully walked away with some additional information knowledge. Uh, you're right, Jim, this is fun. I enjoy doing it with you. I enjoy doing these in general. Happy to talk yeah. about cockroach. So that's awesome. We'll do Thanks, more. Buddy. Awesome. And we will. And and one last thing, y'all, we are actually holding a conference. If you want to actually interact with us directly, actually in our office, um, you know, go to our website and check out, uh, look for Roachfest uh, underneath the, the company banner up there. Uh, and join us next week in New York City. Uh, actually, a week and a half. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to shrink that time. There's a lot we got to do between now and then. I'm sure there's people will be like, wait a second, it's got to be a week and a half. So anyway, uh, listen, everybody, thank you for taking the time out of your day. I know it's, it is it is meaningful because I know we're all pretty busy people. So, uh, but with that, thanks again, Tim. Thanks everybody, uh, both on the, the Zoom and in, 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 in YouTube out there. So, and everybody have a great day.